and she she has so much knowledge and so much information so thanks for joining us for our for this class today and feel free whether it's uh, pertaining to what you learned today or anything Tracy is great we could call her on the weekends we could call her at, in the evenings so it's wonderful to have a title officer with that much experience available so Tracy Kelly Rojas take it away <laughs> okay great well hi everybody it's good to be able to connect with you today we're so glad to be able to still interact this way a lot of you already know me, but for those that don't, I am the field title officer with Orange Coast Title. I'm part of Joanne's team. I'm an extra layer of customer service. I was a title officer for 25 years. And the beauty of that is I saw behind the scenes for years the most common issues that would slow transactions down or stop transactions. And so they became the eight obstacles, eight common obstacles that I talk about. And I teach about each one of those obstacles separately in a lengthier class, but we're going to cover some today, uh, just the most common and which ones they are, why they occur, and how you can problem solve prior to getting too far into a transaction. Now, as a title officer and also I was raised by an agent, so I've kind of been around this, uh, the real estate for certain all my life. Um, and so I know that referral business is very important to real estate agents. I know that the first impression is important in life and the last impression is important in real estate transactions and that's an understatement. We wanna see a smooth closing, so referral business, um, is, there's a high percentage uh, you know, chance for that. Um, a lot of my agents that I talk to have told me that up to 100% of their business is referral business. So that's true. We want to avoid um, having any obstacles come up at the last minute and troubleshoot them in advance. And there's an easy way to do that. And just knowing what they are is one step in the right direction. So I'm going to cover a few real quick. Um, some of the most common obstacles right now, especially as of January of this year, California is required with new construction to have solar panels on homes that are built. And so solar is going to be more and more part of our world. We already know that solar liens, solar contracts, solar leases um, are part, they are in play in real estate now and they can create a delay in a transaction or just a little bit of conversations that are had last minute that can be a little bit intense that really don't need to, to be had. They can be had in the, in the very beginning of a transaction. The other issue with uh, solar or green energy is also the HERO loans. You all may have heard about the HERO loans. I put those two topics together because they do relate to green energy. Um, when it comes to solar uh, panels, you can see them, so they're obvious. If you ever take a listing and you see solar panels on the roof, you know very likely there's a contract or a lease in place. So in the very beginning when you get a listing, all of these topics that I'm gonna go over, you should have conversations with your sellers early on prior to getting into escrow when you've got a buyer, buyer's agent. Sometimes the buyer has an attorney. And then we've got a lender as well that may want to understand something about a seller side item like a solar contract. So if in fact you see solar panels, start talking to your sellers about the fact that um, in their contract, it might say that they can take their solar panels with them, if you can believe that. Uh, what if a buyer doesn't want the solar panels? What if they do want them, then they have to be transferred to them through a formal process and you should be prepared for that. Prior to selling the property, the seller's contract should be reviewed really quickly. I can help you do that to see what the terms are relating to solar. There can be money in, in connection to that solar contract as well. And then with hero liens, hero liens or hero loans, I don't know if all of you have heard about a hero loan, but it is the Home Energy Renovation Opportunity Loan. It's paid through property taxes, and so it's sort of a hybrid. It is a loan but you will see this loan recorded not concurrently in a prelim or not shown concurrently in a prelim uh, chronologically. You'll see it right below the taxes. So rather than being shown on a, in the prelim, in the chronological order where you would typically see a loan after the easements and CCNRs, instead the HERO loan, you will see it right below the taxes because it's paid through the taxes. So know to look for it there. 
Today, if I were an agent, I would ask all of my sellers, do you have a hero loan? Do you have any solar uh, contract or lease? Uh, certainly, if you see those panels again, I would ask that question. It's a modern question to ask and people have those issues and they don't discuss it until further into the transaction. It can be problematic. The hero loans, just so we're all clear on that, those are loans that are given and they can include up to 90 different sort, sorts of home improvements that can be done for green energy, uh, water conservation, electric conservation, and they can include double paned windows, heating, insulation, uh, plumbing, you name it, almost everything could fall into the category for this loan. And those loans can be over $200,000. They can really impact the proceeds and you really want to know about that early on. So ask your sellers about Hero Loans, Lean, Solar, have that conversation. Um, the number one issue that will slow a transaction, and it's been the same case for decades, it's nothing new, but for some reason it doesn't seem to get talked about until later on in a transaction often, is the seller's possible liens, judgments, bankruptcy issues, all of those can impact a sale. And again, that's another thing I would ask if I were an agent, I would ask of my sellers, do you have anything I can help you with? We know that other people's transactions get slowed down due to a judgment, a child support judgment, an IRS lien, a state lien. Do you have anything I can help you with? It's just a standard question for all sellers um, at that very beginning point is a great time for them to disclose if they have anything because most creditors will be open to negotiation particularly um, if the sale will be stopped if the seller cannot pay it in full if there's not enough to pay that loan in full so they feel as if they can't proceed with the closings there's not enough proceeds to pay let's say a hundred thousand dollar irs lien the IRS will consider negotiating taking less, but that's something you want to know in the beginning because that negotiation with the creditor could take a month or two. And if you get a 10 day all cash, you want to be ready to close. So the only way really to be prepared is by asking your sellers from the beginning, is there anything I can help you with? Again, IRS lien, state liens, judgments. I would talk to my sellers in the beginning about that. Um, and also, some of our agents in the South Bay particularly that we've been talking to are starting to include the statement of information, which has to be cleared on every seller prior to close. They're starting to include that form and we have it on our website where the sellers fill out their information so we can look for liens and judgments. We can do that for you early. If you're working with us, we certainly feel comfortable to start clearing liens and telling you if we see anything. But I would always ask sellers from the beginning because by doing that, we can eliminate and again, give them time to negotiate if they need to do that. And some leads are already paid and they just simply need to go through their records and find a release, for example. Better to have them doing that at the very beginning before they've got their boxes packed and it's still relaxed before the property sells. Once the property sells, it gets pretty exciting. There is a clock ticking and we have more parties involved. So. Take advantage of the time from when you get the listing to the selling point, whether it's 30 days or 60 days, take advantage of that time. Um, one of the, the next issues is old deeds of trust. So old loans, deeds of trust, the seller may have taken out multiple loans and maybe they've got a credit line that they've never used. Maybe they have a second on their property that they paid off recently that's still showing of record. So zero in on that. I would imagine you all ask your sellers how much they owe on loans against the property versus what the, the value of the property is so you can determine proceeds. So in the beginning, you're asking them, how many loans do you have on the property? How much approximately is owed? If on the preliminary report, title report, you see more loans than they make reference to, you might wanna ask them about that really early on. If they tell you they have one loan and you see two or three on a prelim, talk to them in the very beginning about those other loans to give them again time to check their records to see if there is a release in their records. Some lenders, when they're paid off, they do not issue a release right away. Some in fact don't seem to ever issue them at all uh, without being prompted. So the client may have to reach out to their lender for a release if they paid a loan recently, so we can get proof of that and remove that item. 
Some clients have equity lines that they never use, but they're of record, so they show as a loan. But if there is a balance, it would be good to know about that. Uh, you might find it hard to believe, but some sellers have told me, probably I've had about 10 occasions where a seller's told me that they forgot about a loan they have on the property. So take a look at the pre -alum. It's gonna tell you if there's any old loan that's of record that hasn't been resolved and start talking about those with your seller. Those are very common uh, issues that can delay a transaction. As a title officer in the, in the office when I was closing transactions for many years, pretty much every day I would get a call from an agent or an escrow officer asking me to eliminate a deed of trust that's showing on our preliminary report as open because the client had paid it recently or sometimes even paid it a few years earlier and the lender had just never released it. So that's a super common issue. Uh, creditors, lenders, when they lend money, they make sure to get their lien of record, their deed of trust of record, but when they get paid off, again, they don't always release the property. So it looks like there's more than the one loan that maybe the seller says that they have. We wanna address those early. Um, don't be surprised if you see more than one on the prelim. Again, super common. Give the, give the seller a chance to start looking through their records. They may not realize the impact those old loans have, and they might actually be sitting on a reconveyance or release that they didn't realize they had. If a lender sends it directly to them to record, they might not know to record it. So again, we wanna give them time to look for it. Better to address it in the beginning than later on once the property sells. So that's another common scenario is those old loans. Now in Southern California, we have an unusual scenario here. I think it's unusual probably from the rest of the country. In Southern California, we have a lot of homeowners that are very savvy, and they realize that you can record a deed from friends to family, from parents to child, between siblings, uh, business partners deed back and forth between each other, and spouses deed between each other. And all of those sorts of deeds, those are not what we're part of, bona fide purchases, where there's a buyer, seller, money exchange, an escrow company, a title company, those deeds, the friends and family deeds, those are uninsured deeds. Nobody's verifying the validity of those deeds, but we have a lot of them in Southern California. So every agent should know if you ever see on your preliminary report a vesting, which is the ownership showing, saying subject to. If your vesting is ever anything other than just your parties that are selling and there's a subject to, that means there's been an uninsured transfer. So your owner that's selling acquired it with no insurance, just simply a deed between friends and family, and it was recorded. So something for all of us to know is those deeds that are recorded that way, the recorder is not checking for the validity of those documents. They're not verifying if they're accurate. They're not able to tell if they're forged. A recorder is looking for recordability only. So they're looking to make sure those deeds are filled in, all the blanks are filled in, they have a live signature and notary, and they have a mailing address at the top left so they can get that document back to the person that gave it to them. So that's what the recorder's doing. They're looking for recordability. So, so I would say know the difference, uh, recordability and being accurate or valid transfer is a very different thing. So uninsured deed scenarios, the thing to know about those is if somebody came off title to your seller through a deed that was not insured, it was just recorded, it has, the validity of it hasn't been verified and we need to go through that process in title. The reason why that's important to an agent early on to address is because whoever came off title through that uninsured deed transferring to your seller, they're going to need to participate in the sale. Uh, we try to make, make it super simple. It's standard in title insurance to have anybody that came off title through an uninsured deed fill out an affidavit, basically a conveyance confirmation. Um, the majority of it is already tight for them. They just simply need to acknowledge that it really was them that transferred the property, that they have no interest in the property. They sign it, it's notarized, super minimal, but we need them to participate. So if the current owner isn't in contact with them, we want to give them some time to find them. You would be surprised at how many gift deeds 
gift transfers between family and friends that there are where the current owner is no longer in contact with the person that transferred the property to them. It's very common. So again, you want to give them time to find the person that gave the property to them so we can have them join in on the confirmation conveyance statement. And also remember, anybody that's ever on title to property, even if it's only for a day, even if it's only for a day, all of their creditors come on title with them. So if they have IRS liens, child support liens, you name it, those sorts of creditors that have recorded their liens, we have to consider them. Even if they've deeded off title up until the point that they deeded off title, their liens that are already recorded attach and they have to be paid out of the proceeds. I'm gonna give you an example. I had an agent in Orange County that was considering selling a property that he owned and he decided instead to bring a friend on title with him. So he recorded one of those deeds. He took it to the Hall of Records, drew it himself, deeded the property from himself to himself and his friend because his friend was gonna help him qualify for a loan and he decided to keep the property. About a week after he brought his friend on title, he changed his mind and decided to sell the property instead of taking out a loan. He recorded another one of those deeds from his friend and himself back to himself. So his friend was only on title for a week through this uninsured deed, just recording deeds on his own. When he went to go sell the property, the title company showed the effect of those uninsured deeds back and forth because no one's verified the validity of his friend's, friends coming and going up title. And once his friend had been on title, even just for a week, all of his creditors came on title too. So any liens recorded up until that point would have to be considered. Creditors have rights, they have to be considered. So when this agent was selling, it was discovered that his friend who was on title for a week had a child support lien for $20,000. The friend who had come off title didn't have the money to pay it. The agent who owned the property had to pay his friend's lien through his proceeds, if you can imagine that. And so the impact of those uninsured deeds, friends and family, they are significant and we will always need the parties that came off through those deeds to participate and again say that they have no interest it really was that we have to verify the validity of that transfer um, and so we're going to be going through that process better to address it in the beginning than later on they say they can't find them it could be a panic situation which we've had many times where it wasn't really thought about till the very uh, last week or so and then they're trying to locate them and they can't locate them so just a heads up about that. Also, I've had an occasion where, or two where somebody that came off title recently to the seller that's selling now, where they saw on the statement that they filled out, that confirmation of conveyance statement, they put a little note that they did give the property, it was them, but they're due $20,000 or they're due half the proceeds. Well, we want to know that because we want to get that statement to escrow so we can bring them into the transaction they get paid for their off-record agreement that they have with the seller. So those uninsured deeds are really important. Just know what's happening behind the scenes. We're verifying the validity of those transfers because the Hall of Record has not done that. They've just looked for recordability. Big difference. A lot of people don't know that. They believe if the deed is recorded, it must be valid. It's transferred the property. And in reality, it has transferred the property, but the validity of it has not been verified. The parties that came off title may not even be the owners, may not be accurate, and that's what we're doing behind the scenes. So just something to be aware of. Another issue that uh, we've seen come up through uh, tra in transactions is you may see an encroachment issue or a buyer may notice a possible encroachment issue or a neighbor might come over and tell you about an encroachment issue that they're aware of during the sale transaction. Now, an encroachment issue is this. Uh, an easement is a legal right to access somebody's property and encro or to use their property for something. An encroachment is an illegal use. So if our property that is the subject property has a fence built over the lot line onto the adjoining property, that's an encroachment. If there's a shed that's built that's crossing the lot line, that potentially is an encroachment. Uh, a neighbor could have a garden area that extends onto our property. Um, that could be an encroachment and on and on. There are many different 
parts of buildings that could be encroaching, even a pool, uh, depending on when it's built, could be encroaching across the property line. So if you ever see something like that, or a buyer has a concern about an encroachment that they might notice, or we've even had, again, neighbors come over and talk to the agent uh, for the subject property and tell them they believe there's an encroachment. If that ever happens, bring that to our attention early on. We can help you assess the situation. The earlier, the better. Know that we do have title inspection companies that are hired by us to go be our eyes. They can meet the client at the property. They're trained to determine where lot lines are. Typically, they can do that. They are not surveyors, but they certainly have the skill to go out there to the property and very likely can tell you where the property line is and if there is an encroachment issue or not. So their being able to be on site is really um, something that's beneficial because if there is a dispute about a property line, they might be able to settle that just by being present. You can make an appointment to have one of those inspectors go out and meet you. They can meet with the buyer and seller if need to be. Uh, they certainly can do that. Again, they're just inspectors, they're not surveyors, but they have the skill to uh, typically determine where the lot lines are. So know that that exists. And if it turns out that there is an issue, um, if it's a matter of an easement, they need to, a neighbor needs to use our property or they have been for many years, they could get a legal easement for that use. And if so, there, there may be a need for an attorney to be involved to draw the document. And again, you want time for that. So if there's ever an issue about that, talk to us about it early. We can help walk you through that process. In fact, most of these things really, if you uh, discuss them a little bit in the beginning with the client, you're made aware of something, just call us. We'll walk you through it. We'll get you at least on your way to the right person to, to assist with or give you some good advice. Um, another issue, that I'd like to bring up. In fact, let me take a moment, let's ask uh, or see if there are any questions right now before I go any further. I'm gonna check the Q&A. How do you get rid of the HERO loan and is it best to do this through escrow or prior to escrow? So the HERO loans, let's talk about those for just a second. And I do, by the way, have a, a HERO and solar class separate from this. Um, that we can also bring to you if you want to have that class, reach out to Joanne and we can, can book that for you. So how do you get rid of the HERO loan? Uh, HERO loan slash lien. So the HERO loan is just like any other loan on the property. It is truly a loan against the property. It is a lien in turn and it is recorded. It's a record matter. The public will see it. It attaches to the property. So typically the way that it's addressed is there is a demand ordered from the tax collector's office. The HERO loan is a hybrid. It's not paid directly to the lender. It's paid through the property taxes, which is unusual for a loan. Uh, it is paid through the property taxes. The taxes are increased due to being paid through the property taxes. So escrow will order a demand like they do for other loans. They'll just automatically order that demand. Now, the concern in the beginning is not that it can be problematic um, to address if we're all aware of it and we know that it exists and escrow is brought to their attention, uh, that it can be paid at the close. The concern is this, with the HERO loan, sellers often think they're much less than they actually are. The HERO loans have additional fees and interest that have to be paid. We've had clients many times think they're about half as much as they actually are. So that's where they're problematic because if a hero loan is much larger than the seller thinks, then it could impact their proceeds. It could impact them so much that there aren't enough proceeds to even pay that loan. So the reason why I say address that in the beginning is talk to the client, get some information about that hero loan, and as soon as you can, reach out to the tax collector or have escrow do that as soon as it's open, bring it to their attention so they can get an amount to pay it so you know that you're okay with the proceeds being enough to pay it, to address it. Um, that's been the biggest surprise with HERO loans is that they're much larger than the owner thinks. And so we just want to make sure we have a pretty good estimate as to how much it is. Um, the other thing with HERO loans is again, because it's shown right below the taxes, it gets overlooked often. So we disclose it, it's a record, we show it on the prelim, it is 
uh, reflect it right below the taxes with recording information. It'll indicate that it is a green energy, you know, conservation loan lien. But I think because we're on a learning curve, a lot of people don't recognize what it is. They're not familiar with it and it gets overlooked. So just zero in on your prelims. We can help walk you through that or ask your sellers, do you have a hero loan? Now, hero loans, by the way, they're not always for solar panels. You may not even know just by looking at the property that it has a hero loan. So it can be a little bit more subtle. The solar companies' contracts and panels, those are obvious. That's all they do. And you see the solar panels, you can ask your seller immediately. You see it, you can't miss it. The Hero Loan, remember, the improvements for Hero Loan are things like double paned windows, plumbing, air conditioning, insulation. So you might not see it. And that's critical because if you don't see it and you don't know all those improvements are made, how do you even know how to uh, price the, the property correctly if you don't know all the improvements that were made? Um, a seller will have to pay that loan off at the close. Escrow will order the demand, but you will, may not have a sales price correct because you may not realize that they put $150,000, let's say, of improvements into the house. Um, so again, I would have that discussion with the seller and early as early as possible to get a sense of how much we're talking about and also um, that it's addressed early on so you have a correct sales price uh, there's another question my seller is going through a divorce his soon to be ex-wife filed a list pendants on the property which is common by the way the attorney sent escrow a proposed stipulation order but title c needs judge to sign the document in order to clear can't the wife just notarize a quick claim deed and we can move on? So what I would say relating to that, a Liz Pendens um, is, I have seen several transactions where Liz Pendens were recorded by a spouse because of a divorce that was ongoing. Um, once a Liz Pendens is recorded, and by the way, that's an action against the property. The reason why people record Liz Pendens is they know it, once it goes off record, the public can see it and it will stop a transaction because it's a cloud on title. Somebody is stating that they have a right to the property or a percentage or money due them and it's their way of, of claiming that and slowing a transaction by making their action of record. So once they do that, it's there. It attaches to the property, the public can see it, and a buyer certainly does not want to buy property that has an action recorded against it. So could the spouse record a quick claim deed uh, to the seller so they can sell? Yes, they, of course they could, but the only problem with that is you still have the action on the property, right? So the buyer is going to buy the property and the action still of record. Um, unless it's actually withdrawn formally, uh, it will be there. And so that's why it's problematic. They won't get clear title. They'll get title. Uh, they'll acquire title that has a cloud uh, showing. And if they go to refinance or to sell, that cloud will be problematic for them. So always when there's a Les Pendens uh, prior to closing, the claimant, the plaintiff that filed that should, or their attorney should issue a demand for any fees relating to it and a withdrawal to get it off the record uh, so the buyer has clear title. Uh, whenever there's an ongoing uh, disagreement dispute uh, that needs to be mediated, it should be mediated prior to the close of our transaction so we can get those liens. And that's why that's important, just because of the fact that it's recorded. So um, if you have a question you want to ask me further about that, you can always reach out to me after this as well, and we can get into that specific transaction. And I'll see if I can give you some more advice on that. I've got another question regarding the transfers. Should there be any concern if subject property is in, in an individual name transferred into living trust, several trustees of that trust over time, and then transferred back to the individual's name? Is the transfer of title into and out of the trust an issue? So that's exactly what I was talking about earlier. Those transfers, those friends, family transfers in and out of your trust, um, that are not insured, those sorts of transfers, again, they're not like what all of us are part of. They're not a bona fide purchase where there is uh, someone checking, verifying the validity of those documents. There's no escrow, there's no title, there's no real estate agents. 
those transfers between family and friends, or even myself to my trust, myself to my LLC, those are all just recorded at the Hall of Records. Nobody's verifying them. Therefore, uh, what has to be done is we need to assess each step of the way to verify the validity of each transfer. And depending on whose name was in that trust, whose trust it was, who the trustees were, if it's transparent, then it's not problematic. I'll give you an example. If I own the property in my name, Tracy Cully Rojas, and then I recorded deed to my trust, so deeding to Tracy Cully Rojas, trustee of the Tracy Cully Rojas Trust, dated whatever the date is, that's really transparent. I'm deeding from myself to myself as trustee of my trust. You can't really miss who's on title there or whose trust it is because the name of my, the trust is my own name. Um, so when it's transparent like that, we don't need anything relating to the trust because we know whose trust it is. But it's, if it's ever a situation where you have additional uh, trustees and they're not the same as the name of the trust, then you have to find out if they have authority to do that, transferring back and forth. And if they even are the actual trustees, they have authority to um, sign the documents. So then in that case, we would ask for trust agreements to verify. Uh, we will have to verify the validity of every one of those transfers, check those signatures. And so, yeah, there is a process relating to those uh, unless it's super transparent. So we will have to, not that it can be problematic, but it will have to be verified. And remember, anybody that's come on title um, to property, their creditors come on as well. So we have to check that also. Now I'll see if I can take another question. Uh, when adding someone to title, how does someone go about ensuring through title? So when adding somebody to title, now, typically, title insurance companies are insuring a transaction, whether it's a bona fide purchase or a bank loan, or insuring the position for the new lender in the case of lender's insurance or the buyer in the case of a purchase transaction. Now, those kinds of transfers, even if it's just a percentage of the interest, a portion of the interest, if somebody buys 50% of someone else's interest in their property, there's typically money exchanged between the parties. In that case, we could very likely insure that transfer, even if it's only for 50% of the property or 30% or whatever it is. There's a bona fide purchase happening, we could insure it. Um, so bringing somebody on title, depending on the circumstances, case by case, we could possibly insure that. You'd have to talk to us about that. But transfers that are just friends and family in general, gift transfers, those are not insurable. Those are done at your own risk. And uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Okay. Wait, can you get the first one on there? Uh, let's see. Does the title company charge to go out to the property to check the property line? Okay, good question. So the question is, does the title company charge for us to go out, check the property line? We're actually not the company that is checking the property line. What we're doing is we are using title inspection companies that do that. They're not surveyors, like I said earlier, they are title inspection companies. Uh, they are inspectors and they are an outside company, so they will charge for their service. Typically, they run anywhere from 75 to 150 to do that um, inspection, uh, depending on if it's a rush um, or if it's an extraordinary distance. We've had some properties in Catalina that we've had inspectors go over to check out for us. Of course, that would increase the fee uh, for that transportation back and forth. Um, but typically, again, they can go out for you on a regular basis within a day or two or three, and it would be somewhere around 75 to 100. If it's a rush or an extraordinary distance, it would be more than that, but that's about what they charge. They are a separate company, all of us. Title insurance companies have our inspectors that are our eyes for things in general, uh, high liability properties, that sort of thing. We want somebody to take a look at those for us but they can as well be used for what I referred to earlier. And then uh, concern about an encroachment, for example, uh, they can do that for you early, mediate that, tell you if it really does appear if there's one or not, and give a chance for maybe an easement to be created or, you know, it just depends on the circumstances, but they can go out there and, and check the property lines for you. I'm gonna check really quickly here to see if we have any other questions. I think you're good right now. Okay, good. All right, so um, I think I'm going to, I'll give you another obstacle or two real quick and then we'll wrap it up. 
Um, we've covered the lien issues. Child support is one more that I add in general to that. Child support, the DA's office, when we order, when escrow orders demands for those sorts of judgments, just everybody to be aware of, uh, those demands typically will take two or three weeks. They often cannot be rushed. Um, they're different in, than a, another sort of judgment, just a credit card judgment, for example. Those companies that have judgments, they have attorneys that are used to issuing demands really quickly within a day or two. The DA's office, child support judgment being very different, they can take two, three weeks. They have a formal process and it's a lot harder to get a demand quickly from them just something for us all to be aware of. If your seller ever tells you they have a child support issue, and again, I would ask all my sellers, do you have anything I can help you with or we should know about? Um, if they ever mention that to you, as soon as you get into escrow the first day, I would let the escrow know. I'd give them a heads up about it um, because they'll want to issue that or order that demand right away so it doesn't slow the transaction. Often with child support liens, they can be substantial. They, I've seen child support liens well over 100,000 before. So, know that it's hard for title companies to assess how much is due and so for us just to close and hold money until the demand comes in is a little trickier with child support it can be uh, possibly so give escrow a heads up if you ever know about that that's another one of those common obstacles so they can get working on it give them a head start um, i'm going to cover one more quick obstacle and that would be substandard notices substandard notices most of us are familiar with these but just in case you're not a substandard notice is a notice recorded by a government agency, either a city or a county agency, because the property has something that's problematic about it, whether it's overgrown weeds or multiple cars parked on the property, or let's say stairs that are dilapidated that you can see that look dangerous, something that's a fire hazard, something that can typically be seen from the outside, uh, the city agencies and the county agencies are looking for those sorts of things and they will send notices to the homeowners telling them to bring them up to the standard they should be at or they will be charged fees for not doing that. Um, also, sometimes, you know, there's a block with a person that lives on it that is not maintaining their property and it's a hazard and their neighbors turn them in. That happens. So bottom line is, the government agencies know about it that are re regulating that issue. They record notices of substandard property on the property. So when we check the records, we'll see that. And they have to be brought up to the standard they should be, which means any repairs should be made that need to be made. All the, you know, the property, if it has to be cleaned up, it, it has to be done. But then an inspector has to be called out to approve the changes that have been made before the notice can be released. And that's where it can be time consuming. So if you ever see a substandard notice on a prelim, that means a property had something about it at some point, maybe it doesn't have that problem today, but at some point it did. And unless an inspector has signed off on the improvements or the corrections, um, they will not generate a release for that notice and that could create a delay. Um, it could take them 30 days to get out and to inspect the property and sign off. So if you ever see that or if a seller ever mentions a substandard notice, you want to address that early on, have the owner call the city or county and get them to get a, an, an appointment set up for the inspector to come out, approve it and sign off to get the notice released prior to close. Again, that's another issue a buyer does not want on their property when they close and it needs to be addressed. Now, like child support, the notices of substandard are hard for us to determine how much is due in fees, penalties, but also what were the improvements? What is the issue really we're talking about? Sometimes it looks like maybe it's just an overgrown you know, weed issue. It's something simple, but it could be much more than that. It could be a permit issue. It could be, again, stairwell or something that's dilapidated and um, could be more expensive to remedy or something that could create a delay that we can't really get a sense of how much money we should hold and close. So those are a little harder for us to, to do that with, and they could create a delay. So substandard notice, I would just give you a heads up on that. Um, if you ever see them, you can reach out to us and we'll kind of walk you through what to start talking to your seller about um, so they don't create a delay.
So I think we've covered, I'm gonna recap really quickly. These are common obstacles, and when I say common, I mean there are issues that come up every day in real estate transactions every day, particularly the statement of information not being cleared until towards the end of a transaction, the seller's liens, judgments, bankruptcy issues. Those are a very common delay. They will pull a recording today, tomorrow, the next day, they're that common. Um, so always ask your sellers if there's anything that they have that you can help them with. That's number one um, obstacle in real estate that can be easily remedied by having some conversations about it. Even if they owe more than they have in proceeds, the creditor will very likely negotiate so they can get paid something, but that takes some time. Old loans, be aware of those. If they're on a prelim, you notice more loans showing on a prelim than your seller says they have. Ask them to check their records, start going through those records and see if there's any proof that they've paid them if that's the case. Uninsured deeds, really common problem, those deeds between family and friends. The vesting ever says anything like subject to and other parties' interests refers to uninsured deeds. Just know that the recorder is only looking for recordability. Nobody's checked the, um, the validity of it or for forgery or accuracy, so that's what we're doing. And whoever came off title, we need to locate them and make sure they're available to sign a statement. By the way, if someone that's come off title through an uninsured transfer to your seller recently in the last year or two, if they've passed away and they can't fill out that confirmation of conveyance for that reason, obviously, a plain copy of their death certificate could be obtained in lieu of them participating. The death certificate's gonna tell us quite a bit about them and it'll substantiate that their, their interest is not a concern any longer, so just know, know about that. Hero lien solar contracts, modern issue. It's gonna grow, it's not going away. It's something we should be very much aware of. Um, that those issues do exist. Solar contracts, there are things to think about with those solar contracts. Again, does a buyer want that solar panel on the roof? Does the seller want to take it with them? Some contracts say they can within 75 miles or um, you know, different mileage, but contracts can say things like that, so you want to address that early on. Uh, encroachments, we have inspectors that can help you with that. Don't let those statements like from a neighbor or a buyer about maybe something crossing the lot line that's concerning go past you because it may come up again at the last minute and cause a delay to start talking to us about those early. Child support, substandard notices, those take a little longer to assess, be aware of that. And I think really, um, you know, don't work harder, just ask a few more questions in the beginning, that's all I would say to make you a little bit more modern, have a more modern approach, address it in the beginning when it's just you and your seller. It's so much easier to have those conversations when it's just the two of you or whoever your sellers are and yourself so they can check their records at their leisure before it gets really stressful. It's pretty relaxed in the beginning when you're talking about those things. Once you get into escrow, you've got parties wanting to know what's happening with those sellers issues. You've got buyer, lender wanting to know and wanting items removed and then the heat is on, the clock is ticking and it becomes more stressful. So just take a modern approach, address as much as you can in the beginning, I can help you do that. Joanne can help you do that. Uh, we are here for you and we take your business seriously. So thank you for having me, me present to you today. All of these subjects, by the way, we have separate classes on and we can really get in a little bit more into them, but I may, I'm glad we were able to bring you some information. So. Thank you very much. Nikki, Tracy, Joanne, is there anything you wanted to add? Tracy, there's a couple in the Q&A. Did you get those? Sure, let me take a peek and see what we have. Will title company let us know what issues are of concern on the prelim? Okay, so that's a good question. So will we let them know about these issues on the prelim? Once title is brought into play in a transaction, we generate a preliminary report. And anything of record, we are going to show it. So if there's a hero lien, we're gonna show it. If there's old deeds of trust, we're gonna show it. Now remember, title insurance companies are not always brought into play until, sometimes until escrow opens. So if you don't have a title company already participating at the listing point, if you don't have us join in then, and we join in when escrow gets open, that's when we'll be disclosing things. And again, we don't want to be having conversations with the seller once we've gotten into escrow, because by then you've missed out on 30 or 60 days that you could have already been problem solving from the beginning. 
So absolutely anything title insurance related, we're going to disclose it on our prelim from the get go. Um, it's a matter of we disclose it, we show it to everybody in the transaction. It's a matter of um, when you read the prelim, do you know what you're seeing and you know the effect that it's having, right? So I guess that's the goal today. Um, start asking questions earlier on prior to it getting into escrow. You could, if you have a concern, you could have Joanne get a prelim started for you. Uh, if you're using Orange Coast Title as your title company, we can get a prelim started and we can help you troubleshoot it early on. But still take advantage of asking your seller if there's anything you can help them with ahead of time. Otherwise, you're, you're missing out on that, that time between listing and selling. So yeah, of course, we're gonna show anything title related, absolutely. It's just a matter of it being read and, and being acknowledged. And now you know the impact, by the way, that those items on the prelim have. Now there's another question, all these obstacles need to be paid off prior or can it be paid off from the proceeds at closing? So that's a great question. Does the seller need to address these issues prior to closing? No, they do not. Most of these issues are actually something that would be paid at the close of the transaction. Um, what we're talking about right now is really making sure there's enough to pay them. Uh, making sure that those liens or judgments that you know about what they are early as you as possibly can so you know that your seller has enough in proceeds to pay them. I've had sellers that had IRS liens for 100000 I had one seller that had one for 500000 And I've seen sellers with hero loans for well over 200000 that the agent had no idea that there was even a hero loan, number one. They barely had enough in proceeds. They got very little when they were expecting to get more at the close because the seller didn't even realize how much they owed to the hero loan. And also, uh, because it wasn't discussed early, all the improvements that were made through the hero loan a few years earlier were not taken into consideration. The sales price could have been increased had the agent talked to the seller about that hero loan and all those improvements, at least a portion of that would have increased the sales price. So at the close, when they had to pay it off, at least they, um, they benefited by the sales price being more accurate. So that's why we're talking about those things a little bit earlier on is to address them and make sure that there isn't an issue with regards to those. Now, all these obstacles need to be paid. So we, caught, we got that. Is it possible to share these eight obstacles with us via email? Absolutely. So we've got a flyer with my information and Joanne's as well. So you can reach us if you need us. And it does make reference to these eight common obstacles. So Joanne will make sure to get that to you. Joanne can give her email. Um, Joanne can give her yes, email. Please, um, please I'll, I'll put my info in the question and answer or the chat. And um, then we'll be happy to send it out to you. OK, great. All right, so Nikki or Joanne, is there anything you want to add before we wrap? Tracy, did you catch that first question there in the Q&A? Let me take a look. Will title company let us know what issue? Yes, we've already got okay, that. Okay, perfect. And yeah, I think we are good to go. Okay. Um, Joanne, are you, do you have, are you gonna put your info or do you want me to put it out? Um, if you don't mind, if you wanna do it, Nick, that would be great. You're probably faster than me. Okay. So I'll put it in the chat for you guys. That's the link to our affiliate page and Joanne's info is on there. Yeah, I'm very easy to reach. And I'll just throw my phone number out here while I'm on here at 310-993-JOJO. That's 310-993-5656. All right. And Nikki well, on my email. Everyone be well. And thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate being able to interact with you. This is still a way of us staying connected and, and we are very, really, really thankful for that. If you learned a little today or if you had a refresher about things you already know, that was our goal. And uh, reach out if you need us. We would love to, to work with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Joe, for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Everybody Bye -bye. take care. Bye-bye.